The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, Steve Pakin's 2020 conversation about Toronto's hardcore punk scene. While Ontario's capital city in the 1980s looked to many people like Toronto the Good, as it always had, a seething subculture of loud, angry musicians and fans begged to differ. That scene is portrayed in all its glory in the book Tomorrow is Too Late, Toronto, Hardcore Punk in the 1980s. It won the 2019 Heritage Toronto Book Award, and it brings to our studio Sean Cherry, that's him on the left, he is the co-author of Tomorrow is Too Late, and Simon Harvey, a contributing author who is now owner of Ugly Pop Records. Good to have you guys two uh, here for a discussion which is absolutely right in my wheelhouse, I have to tell you. <laughs> I didn't see Sinatra in this book anyway. <laughs> no, no, there was no Sinatra. Anyway, no. you're going you're gonna to educate me, I know, on, on a scene that, uh, frankly, I have no recollection of whatsoever. So this is a good learning opportunity for those of us who missed this whole thing. Daniel Richler, who I do know a little bit and who used to work at this station, uh, once described 1980s Toronto to you, how? Very bleak, grey and concrete. So I, inter I called him up and interviewed him in, in, in London and he sort of, you know, he was a guy who, you know, grew up in the UK and then lived in Montreal before moving to Toronto. So as an outsider, he was able to describe it so eloquently and I went, oh my God, you've nailed it. It was this grey, bleak and he just talked about the parking lots and you know, you'd hop on the TTC and you'd see all this grayness and then you'd go into a club and they were these sweaty, disgusting places, but they had, they, he described them as being filled with bright light and lots of excitement. He lived across the street from Larry's Hideaway, which was on Carlton Street uh, at the top of Allen's Gardens. Mm -hmm. And so it was one of the places he described. It's right near Maple Leaf Gardens. Uh, it's right across, yeah, 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 right down the street from Maple Leaf Gardens. And it was a fancy hotel in the 60s. It was called the Prince Carlton Hotel, but by the time we were teenagers, Larry's Hideaway was mostly a punk and metal club. I am happy to show the book here. Here's, this is what it looks like. And it's actually, it's a gorgeous, sort of coffee table book of uh, all the highlights of the punk scene. But I do have to ask you, what's the attraction exactly? When you're 15 years old, excitement and uh, ideas. There's a, there's a massive outpouring of ideas that came out of that scene that uh, in retrospect, as an adult, some of them are you know naive and not fully formed and so on. But as you go through this, we have the music, the bands, the clubs, et cetera. But then you have all these things about animal rights, queer core, feminism, straight edge, which is a sort of a punk rejection of drugs and alcohol abuse and so on, which doesn't even register with the mainstream, but was a pretty critical part of that scene at the time. And there's all these new ways of thinking and new ways of viewing the world that hit you when you're 15 years old and you're hungry for that kind of thing. If, like me, I didn't live in a place that was particularly bleak or horrifying, I grew up in Scarborough. Well, okay, bleak and horrifying, but a different kind of bleak and horrifying. And, uh, but it was, you know, very middle class and stayed and, you know, it's not the most exciting place to live. But when you came downtown and yes. you saw this. And all the, you're buying these records and hearing this music and it's incredibly exciting, powerful music, but it also, I mean, there's powerful, exciting heavy metal or rap music or whatever as well, I'm sure. And not that those are without their ideas, but the specific ideas that appealed to me when I was 15, 16 years old were being transmitted by this. And that, I'd say the, the combination of this invigorating musical expression and mentally stimulating ideas coming from it that challenged and sort of offered different perspectives well, to the world around you was irresistible. Here's how it's described in the book. You write, many of us didn't enjoy our high school experiences and some of us didn't even make it there at all. The Toronto hardcore scene of the 1980s is where we fit in, a place where we belong for our differences as much for our similarities. This book is intended to be the yearbook we never had, a record of the events that shaped us and the people we grew up with, a proud place where everyone's contribution counted. 
What kind of people, Sean, gravitated to this scene? Well, I'd say we were mostly misfits and outsiders to some degree, and it really was a sense of community. So you, you know, uh, most of us were suburban kids. I always said that uh, difference between punk and hardcore was is that punk was art school and hardcore was high school, which was much, much younger. It was much more suburban, and it really created a community. We were kids who didn't fit into our high schools, but you know, heading down to this, this vibrant scene full of ideas and exciting people, it was a community for us, so. I wonder politically whether it was, you know, thinking mid-1980s, yeah. you've got Margaret Thatcher in power in Great yeah. Britain, you've got Brian Mulroney, conservative here in Canada, you've got Ronald Reagan, yeah. Republican in the States. Is part of this a reaction to all of that? It's part of, partly a reaction to that. It's also, you know, this sense of, of that, you know, we're still living in the Cold War and we could die any moment. So this is still mm. very much in our heads. So we're a bunch of kids that don't see, you know, to, to borrow too much from the Sex Pistols, but they didn't feel like there was always a future. And even the title, Tomorrow's Too Late, is a direct action song, and it really captured the urgency to us that, you know, we, there's something happening and you have to live your life right now because we're not sure if we're even going to be here tomorrow. Now, uh, uh, hmm, how old are you guys? I'm, I'm 52. And you're? 49. 49, okay, you're a little bit younger than me, but I definitely remember these times as well as being very angsty because of the Cold War and all of the nuclear missiles from the Soviet Union yeah. and the U.S. facing each other, and that notion that when you went to bed tonight, you didn't know if you were going to wake up tomorrow. Drills at school. Drills at school. Yeah. But, but my reaction was to go in a very different direction. Like, I went for old-style music, and you guys got into some headbanging crap. Uh, sorry, I should say. <laughs> headbanging stuff that is just completely foreign to me. How come? It was full of energy. It was, I mean, it captured how we were feeling and it was an outlet for it. So, and the exciting thing about hardcore was that it was, it was in part a reaction to punk and we were trying to create something new from it because punk sort of screwed up. It was something that, did, you know, did great music, but, it, you know, they turned into rock stars. The important thing with the hardcore scene, it was very much a do-it-yourself DIY approach and most people involved in the scene were involved in some way. So you, if you weren't in a band, you, you know, did a fanzine, you ran a record label, you did a radio show, you took photos. I, almost everybody was involved in some way. It wasn't just mm. a consumer culture. It was also participatory. Simon, if, if people watching this or listening to this have never heard this music before, how would you describe it? It is rock and roll music. Uh, 60s, think of the Kinks or the early Who, such like that. And uh, very basic stripped down garage, drums, bass, guitar, um, untutored vocals, but everything amped up times 100. That much faster, that much rougher, that much wilder. Taking it to 11, are you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Taking it to 12 even with some of these. And uh, having said that, um, it's, it's punk. It, um, there isn't a clear distinction between punk and hardcore. Hardcore just is short for hardcore punk. And it is what happened through the late 70s and the early 80s where the most obvious characteristics of the Clash or the Ramones or whatever were stripped down to their most basic essentials and everything amped up again. Well, we got a clip here. Let's show this. Because in, in the early 1980s, TVO ran a documentary on Toronto's hardcore punk scene, and it was called Not Dead Yet. So let's show a clip from that film, and then we'll come back and chat. Show sure. them, if you would. I'm curious, SMCs, give it up on me. Okay, what is that? That was Madhouse, I believe. Yeah. yeah. But what is that dancing? That was that was before uh, circle pits became mm -hmm. a thing. So that would be slam dancing, which evolved out of the pogoing from the UK in the in the seventies, late seventies. Yeah. Having said that, musically, that is far from doctrine or hardcore. That is much more traditional punk rock. Like, like the kind of hardcore that really defines this, the capital H hardcore is quite a bit more extreme than that. But that looks like, that, that oh boy, I'm gonna sound like such an old fogey. <laughs> that kind of looks a little dangerous, that kind of dancing. 
It, it was. It started out dangerous uh, in the early 80s period, but by the mid 80s, that was a club called The Turning Point, and then there was a place in the annex that we went to called The Bridge. By then, circle pits were the, 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 the common form, and it, it was not very violent. You would run around in a circle, and if you fell down, somebody would grab you and pull you up. Yes. It was, it, it was almost a joke. I think people sort of saw it as so, much safer than, than uh, that early 80s period. It was, it was energetic, but it was never malicious. Yeah. Because you can imagine that getting out of control. Some guy bumps into another guy a little bit too forcefully, and pretty soon the knives come out, and you got a problem. No we, knives, we, but fists. But fists. And, we had, and there was two. There was two guys that sort of policed the pit in, in Toronto, and so it made they made it safe for all us younger kids. One of whom, Kenny, was front and center in that clip right there. Uh, yeah, Kenny and Anthony. Hmm. In the early 1980s, what role did skinheads play? in the punk scene? So I think there was a bigger role of skinheads in the early 80s, and by the time I get into the scene in 83, 84, they were gone. We had less of a skinhead problem than, I'd say, Hamilton or Montreal. And we had skinheads here, but I'm, I was never sure, uh, people, when we talked to them for the book, they were never sure if they were racist skinheads, which was the problem in other scenes, more mm -hmm. coming from the UK influence. but. Um, by 83, uh, there was a band called the BFGs. I won't, I won't say their, their full name for you. <laughs> well, I think I know what the F stands for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe what the B and the G stand for. Uh, bunch bunch of effing go goofs. goofs. So the right. BFGs, they were one of the, they were, you know, in Kensington Market and they sort of policed the scene and when skinheads got involved, they would deal with them, but between, I would say, heroin and the BFGs, that's sort of solved our skinhead problem <laughs> yes. in Toronto. Can I throw another name at you here? Yeah. Simon, who's the Squamish Five? The Squamish Five uh, is, uh, for lack of a better word, a terrorist group from uh, BC. Uh, they were involved in the bombing of the Lytton Systems plant where the guidance systems for cruise missiles were made. I remember that. I covered that. That was in Etobicoke. Yes. yes. They, they let off a bomb that blew the bloody building apart. Yes. Not something I condone, certainly, uh, but I suppose the connection to Hardcore is that one of the members of that organization, that group, was, uh, was he the bass player in uh, the Subhumans? In the Subhumans, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were a, a pretty radical uh, left-wing strain of the scene that was, I would say, more pronounced in BC than it was here. But the band in Toronto Direct Action took their name from them because they called themselves Direct Action, yes. whereas the media called them the Squamish Five. So mm. that's where Direct Action took their name from was, was that Squamish but Five group. Direct Action, though, was intended to be politically active and violent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, so how much of that was a part of this scene? I'd say it was a part, it wasn't the complete part, the scene was, you know, I think pieces of it were political and pieces of it weren't very political. There's so many different yeah. scenes that really sometimes don't overlap at all. Yeah. That are, you know, there's, I mean, there's totally hedonistic, drug-soaked rock and roll stuff under this, and there's really humorless, stoic, hmm. you know, really austere, black clad, <clears throat> super left wing revolutionary <laughs> stuff. And there's kids that ride skateboards and just want to play fast music, you know, and there, and a million different variations on these and things like clothing and music and approach to drugs and so on just define these different streams within hardcore that make it very difficult to say, this is what hardcore was, or this is what hardcore stood for, because there's just it's a blanket term for a lot of gotcha. different ideas. As you look around the province of Ontario today, how much of it still exists and where? Toronto is very much a thriving uh, scene, and up until last year, we had one of the best, most vibrant festivals called Not Dead Yet, which is named after that documentary that aired on TVO, and Simon is still involved in putting out some of the band's records from the scene today. To a limited extent, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's definitely nowhere near where it was even two years ago. Hmm. Uh, just... Uh, Real estate prices and so on, yeah. I think, have a lot to do with that. People can't afford to, to play in bands because they've got three jobs. There's no small clubs left anymore. Uh, people can't afford to live downtown. I mean, it's what was a thriving scene two years ago is, seems to be dying pretty quickly. Okay, but the rock and rollers who came up in the 60s and 70s and so on, who are now in their <clears throat> 70s and 80s, I yeah. guess, if you look at the Rolling Stones, they're still doing concerts. Are there still concerts for punk bands? Oh, there are. Absolutely. There's, yeah, there's a revival of, yes. of bands coming through that were from the 80s hardcore scene, and there's a very new, vibrant scene, too, that is coming through. Yeah. Like, you can be an old rock and roller. We've seen this. Yeah. Can, you be an, can you be an old punker? 
Oh, completely, yeah. completely. And and everybody, when we were doing the interviews with all the bands, uh, we interviewed about 150 people and had about 50 people's photo collections. But we always asked in the interv interviews, did punk have an impact on you? And every single one of them was still influenced by punk today. Whether you know, not, nobody has a mohawk very much. But Steve <laughs> still has one, but very few people would have the mohawks. But um, it, it it sticks with you. It's a culture that sticks with you. What about this notion? If you were a punker at the time and you got popular, and you signed with a big label, and therefore you made money, how did the community regard that? I don't think that happened in the 80s. That, this, not, no. not, not to Toronto bands, like the big one was Husker Du signing to Warner Brothers, uh, which was you know, seen as a sellout thing at the time. But they'd already changed so much by that yeah. point. That, yeah, people playing this kind of music just did not sign to major labels or get big, and I, and I think sometimes there's a little bit of uh, posturing in that insofar as it's really easy to talk about how you'll never sell out when no one's offering you anything. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and there's the very odd exception of someone like Husker Du that are musically valid and talented yeah. and have enough vision that they do get signed, and then the rhetoric changes a little bit, for sure. Yeah, and that changes with when Nirvana, you know, appears in the 90s, and one of the yeah. bands that we cover, a band that was originally from Meaford and then moved to Toronto called the Sons of Ishmael, they were one of the few bands that toured extensively and they did a West Coast tour. They had Nirvana open for them hmm. when they played in Seattle and they didn't even remember it until years later when a book came out and there was a flyer and they went, oh, that's who that band was that opened for us. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, how about this? Can you be a 50 year old with a house in the suburbs and a minivan and you know a mortgage and kids and still be a punker? Sure. Are you? <laughs> Like I don't have any of those things. I'm dirt poor and uh, have nothing, but uh, I got a great record collection. But do you still <laughs> consider yourself sort of like a punk? Oh, yeah, a I'm punker? a punk. I'm a punk, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You too? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You're not what I think of when I think of punk rock. No, and I, I think even that whole aesthetic, there was most of us look like suburban kids with, you know, lumber jackets and, and jeans and skateboards. Yeah, I look the same way now that I did back then. Just <laughs> even more beautiful. But, uh. <laughs> now, can we take a I'm from Hamilton, and I want to just sort of uh, take advantage of this opportunity, because yeah. to the extent I know anything about punk, we remember Teenage Head, which right. came out of Hamilton, out of Westdale Collegiate. Frankie Venom was the lead singer. Now, they were, I don't know, it, Back in the day, when I was in Hamilton, they were pretty big. Right. On the pantheon of punk bands, how big are they? What do you best think? Canadian record ever made, in my opinion. Really? The first album, best Canadian record ever made. Huh. What do you say? I, my first concert was seeing Triumph at the c and &E and Teenage Head Open. They were both on the same label, and that changed my music trajectory completely, seeing Teenage Head in 1981. This was probably six months after the Ontario Place riot, that the, when they played a show at Ontario mm. Place that resulted in a riot. This was probably about six months after that, and it changed what I was into seeing them. I'd heard them on the radio, but seeing them live sort of changed huh. everything. Because they, uh, teen, now Frankie's gone now, but Teenage Teenage Head did a concert at a Thai Cat game during the last season. And I tell you what, uh, they were louder than the crowd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're still plenty loud. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably the closest thing that we have to the Ramones in Canada. Hmm. Right. Yeah. If you hadn't had a hardcore punk outlet for whatever teenage angst you were going through at the time, Sean, where would you be today? I'd, not in a good place, most likely. I was a working class kid with not uh, great uh, prospects in my future, and punk really allowed me to focus, uh, you know, some of the angst I was having. But then, you know, I did a fanzine and ran a, a record label with friends and started doing radio shows at community radio stations, and it gave me a creative outlet for that angst. So, hmm. Simon, what does it say about the fact that, okay, 35 years ago, if you had a mohawk haircut and you had spikes all over your face and jeans and chains and, you, you know, you're emblematic of that whole punk scene, people noticed. Right. If you walk down Young Street in Toronto today looking like that, ho-hum. Like nobody would notice at all. What does that say? I think there's definitely been, I mean, um, we talked about Nirvana coming up and so on. And what was that, 1990 or something? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't stand that stuff. But it's, uh, <clears throat> there's a commodification of, of any kind of the trappings, the signifiers, the empty stuff of any culture that gets assimilated into mainstream and marketed and, you know. And that's been a successful process. Now everybody in the world has a, has tattoos and Colored you know they market. Yeah, I mean, but did you like it better back in the day when it seemed more? I never anti -establishment? cared too much about that stuff anyway. Really? So yeah, I mean, a lot of us I think at the time almost defined ourselves within hardcore by not being like that. Hmm. You know, there's um, yeah, there was definitely part of one side of hardcore was deliberately responding to what to me in 1985 was already three years old. 
Sean, let me give you the last word here, and I'm going to read a, an excerpt from your book. This yeah. by Jeff Berdahl. Is that how you say his name? Yeah. Okay, from the band Guilt Parade, who said, maybe we didn't put a dent in the universe, but we may have put a little key strike in the paint job. We tried to make people think. Did they succeed? I think I think we did. I think, you know, that's what stuck with people when we asked them about, you know, do you still have that? And the DIY and the questioning of authority and questioning of the common wisdom were things that have stuck with all of the, the, the punks that we talk to to this day. Hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, congratulations on winning the Heritage Toronto Prize. That's a wonderful prize. Thank you. And this is a beautiful book. Well done. And I've learned something, which is why <laughs> I come to work every day. So well done. And it, let's also mention the fact that TVO is going to be airing a documentary on uh, Hamilton's own teenage head later this year. So we urge people to Excellent. keep a heads up for that. Fantastic. Thanks, guys, very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. If Sleeping Giant Provincial Park is on your to-do list as Ontarian staycation this year, you won't want to miss the newly restored local hub known as the Silver Islet General Store. Our Northwestern Ontario Hub journalist Sharnell Anderson visited and she joins us now from Red Rock on the north shore of Lake Superior with details. Hey Sharnell. Hi Dan. All right, so can you give us an idea of where Silver Islet is and what it's known for? Yeah, so if you're in Thunder Bay and you look out towards Lake Superior, you'll see the Sleeping Giant. And so that's actually located on what's called Sibley Peninsula, which is um, just west of the city. Um, and so uh, Silver, Island, Silver Island is actually tucked behind the Sleeping Giant on the Sibley Peninsula. And um, in the mid 1800s, uh, prospectors in the area discovered silver. And so they acquired that land, or a company called Montreal Mining Company acquired that land and they tried to develop it. But it was really challenging because it was a small land mass at the time and the silver, they essentially had to go under Lake Superior in order to access the silver. Um, so they tried for about two years and the company, they're just like, no, this is an engineering nightmare. <laughs> and uh, so they ended up selling the rights to the land to a gentleman named um, Alexander Sibley and his company, uh, Silver Islet Mining Company. And so Sibley was able to develop the land. Um, and so they ended up expanding uh, the island actually almost 10 times its original size using crushed rock. Um, they also built wooden breakwaters around it to try and protect it from the lake. Um, they built a number of other things too. Uh, they built a lighthouse, uh, a bunch of houses for miners and their families. They even built a jail there. So it was really a whole kind of community that they built. The mine operated throughout the 1870s and the 1880s. And um, they excavated over $3 million worth of silver, and it came to be known as the richest silver mine in the world um, until it ceased operations in 1884 because they ran out of coal. And so the coal was used to power the pumps to keep the water out of the mine shafts. Uh, so the, when they ran out of the coal, the pumps failed, and Lake Superior reclaimed the mine. So most people abandoned the area after that, except for a gentleman uh, named James Wilmington Cross. He was uh, a former care, uh, a former captain who kind of became the island's caretaker. And um, over time, uh, most of the miners' shacks were sold to cottagers, and it kind of became a summer um, cottage community, which is how it remains today. Now, I understand one of the other structures that's kind of remained there was the general store, and it had a very different use in the 1800s. What exactly was that? Mm. So as the mining company was kind of uh, developing the land and establishing this community, they built a warehouse, as you mentioned. And so that's where the miners would go and pick up their gear. So stuff like uh, pick pickaxes or clothing, boots, hard hats, uh, stuff like that. But, you know, of course, after all the miners left, uh, this warehouse full of mining equipment wasn't really useful anymore. And uh, so the cross, as I mentioned, uh, who became the island's caretaker, his family kind of took over um, all the uninhabited properties that were left behind, including the warehouse. And uh, they eventually turned that into what is now the general store. Uh, tell us about the family. Uh, I understand, you know, this island, this, you know, islet has a very rich history, but also has an interesting story there as well. What do we need to know about them? Yeah, so there's um, a couple of different family histories here. So I just mentioned the Cross family um, who turned the warehouse into the general store. And so uh, the general store kind of stayed within their family for a few generations. Uh, by the 1980s, it was owned by a gentleman named Sid Halter, who was actually married to Cross's granddaughter, Fia Cross. 
And um, so the current owner, who his name is Jeff Corkola, he owns it alongside with his wife, Sandy. He kind of explained all this to me. And um, so how they came into it. So Sandy uh, has had a brother named Moore. Uh, his name is Lawrence Saxberg, and he was actually an anchor for the CBC for a while. Uh, sadly, he died in an accident in 2006. Um, but the first time Lauren saw Silver Islet, he was out there doing some filming and he fell in love with the place because, <laughs> I mean, it's really not hard to do. Um, and so after that, Lauren inquired uh, about the property and eventually uh, in the late 1980s, uh, the Saxburg family bought it from the Cross family. And uh, so the Saxburgs ran it for a while. So that would be Sandy and Lauren's parents. Um, but of course, as, happen as it happens, uh, they got older and they were no longer able to um, keep up with it. Uh, so they put it up for sale and it was on the market for a few years. There was some interest, but they didn't end up selling it. So they took it off the market. And eventually the stars kind of aligns, allowing Jeff and Sandy to buy it. So keeping it in the family. Now, uh, you, as you mentioned, you spoke to Jeff and I actually want to uh, show some pictures. This is sort of, you know, he has big plans for this. This is actually a photo of the before. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yeah, so it's a photo of a photo, and I'm not entirely sure when the original photo was taken, um, but if you look really closely, you can kind of see people around the building. And on top of the building there, there was actually a platform. And so Jeff explained to me that was called the Widow's Walk. You would access that from inside the building. There were barrels full of water on top, um, which could be emptied uh, in case of fire. So that was kind of their fire safety plan at the time. You know, that uh, the, <laughs> there's a lot of wood in that building, so they needed to do something. Now, I do want to show a photo of what it looks like now. A bit of a nice little refresh there. Mm -hmm. So I took that photo uh, when I went to Silver Islet in June, and that's kind of the front entrance when you pull up. The first thing you notice is really the blue exterior, right? Um, that's kind of come become synonymous with the general store, in my mind at least. And um, as I understand it, I think they're going to kind of honor that and keep it the same blue color. The work that's been done to sort of, uh, you know, renew this area all kind of started with some dock work that was actually quite necessary in order for this all to happen. What do we need to know about that? Yeah, so actually a big part of this, which uh, I think, you know, luckily uh, Jeff and Sandy didn't have to do themselves, was repairing the dock out front in the harbor because that dock was over 100 years old. It was made of timber. It's on Lake Superior. So you can imagine, you know, the kind of shape it was in. And uh, by 2013, it was actually condemned by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, and so, of course, that was a big problem because this is big, expensive infrastructure. Um, but what ended, up, what ended up happening was uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans tore it out and they replaced it with a concrete top dock, which actually my dad worked on. And then they also uh, repaired the breakwater in the harbor and repositioned the boat launch. So they did a lot of this work that kind of allowed uh, Jeff and Sandy to do the work that they're doing now. Some very exciting stuff. Thank you so much, Charnel. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a good weekend, and Nam, we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.